Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to look into functional interfaces and we will look specifically into four functional interfaces that are very commonly used. We will look into predicate, consumer, supplier, and comparator. A functional interface is an interface that has one and only one unimplemented method. The four interfaces that we will be discussing in this video are already present in the Java library and we need to be aware of them. What are they used for? So to start with, with the very first one, let's open predicate interface. On my laptop, I have pressed command plus O. If you're using Windows, hit control plus O to open the search window and type predicate and open the interface that is in java.util.function package. If you scroll through the code, you will see that there are multiple methods. There are some default methods over here and we have some static methods available, but there is only one unimplemented method called test. The predicate functional interface or the other functional interface that we will see in this video, they are all written using generics. Generics is altogether a different topic, but at a very high level, generics is a way in which we define a class or an interface in a generic way. Now, for example, in this case, the arguments of the test method is of type T and the T has to correspond to the T that's written next to the predicate definition. When we declare the predicate variable, we will define the type that will be used. In our case, we will create a predicate of the type animal. That means the argument of test will be animal and the return value of uh, the test method is Boolean. A predicate is used when we have to check some condition. For example, let's say we have a card and we want to check whether it's a debit card or a credit card. In that case, the test method will take a type of card and within the test method, we will write the implementation, which we will do using Lambda. We will write the logic, whether it's a debit card or a credit card. Just as a different example, let's say if you want to figure out whether an employee is a full-time employee or a part-time employee. In that case, we will create a predicate of type employee. And in the test method, or in our case, in the Lambda, we will write the actual logic to define whether that given employee is a full-time employee or a part-time employee. Now, if we look back to the interface that we created in the previous part, the interface was called check condition and that had a method called test and the method took an animal and it returned back a Boolean value. So the predicate that we just saw is very similar to the interface that we actually wrote in the previous part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the check condition interface with the predicate of the type animal. So that animal I'm providing will tell what the input to the test method is. Now I will save and run the program. As you see, the output is still same. So we have a dog and a cat. And the reason we have dog and a cat is the condition that we wrote was that we want to print any animal that can hop. And now we don't even need the check condition interface. So I'm going to delete it and I'm going to save and run the program again just to make sure that it's working fine. The reason Java creators included predicate functional interface or the other functional interface that we will see in the video is that they identified that there are some commonly used scenarios that developers will need. So they actually created these kind of interfaces for us just to use. If these interfaces were not present in the library, then we would have created our own interfaces. So for example, I needed animal, I would have created an interface that would have checked, took an animal, returned a Boolean. And then now let's say I'm creating a different program or some another developer is creating a different program. He needed it for his employees project. And then he had to write his own interface. Now these commonly used interfaces are already part of the Java. So we don't have to create all these interfaces. So it's less code to write and better for the developer. Now let's move on to the next functional interface, consumer. So as you see, consumer has only two methods and only one of them is unimplemented. The second one has a default implementation. So we don't need to worry about that. The consumer is a type of functional interface that takes a value as input, like it takes an argument in the method, but it never returns anything. So the return type of the accept method is void. 
a common use case of a consumer functional interface is that let's say if you want to print something then we can give a input of object like in our case say animal and then we can also give a logic on how we want to print but we don't want any value back so consumers can be used in that instance one thing that i should have mentioned in the previous interface as well is you might have noticed that each of the functional interface is annotated with the functional interface annotation note that the functional interface annotation is not mandatory so this is more for documentation purposes this is more for readability even if we write an interface with one method which is unimplemented that interface is also a functional interface we do not have to annotate the interface so just keep that in mind for the example of a consumer i'm going to create a package called part 2 and a class called functional interface examples and I'll create a main method within that class. I'm also going to create another method called print, which will take a list of animals and a consumer of the type animal. Within the method, I'm going to loop through all the animals in the list and I'm going to pass each animal to the accept method of the consumer. In the main method, I'm going to define a consumer of the type animal. And later on, I'll pass this consumer into the print method. The body of that lambda, the consumer that I'm writing, I'm just having a print statement and I'm printing the name of the animal within the two square brackets. And notice that since this is a consumer, it doesn't return back anything. It's simple print statement and print statement will simply print it on the console and the lambda does not return anything. I'm going to copy the, and paste the code that I have written before to create the list of animals. And now I will call the print method using that list and with the consumer that we just wrote. Now I'm going to save and run the program. As you see, we have printed all the names of the animals here. Moving on to the next functional interface, which is supplier. A supplier has a method called get. The get method does not take any input, but it returns a value which is of the same type as the supplier type. Let's jump back into our class and write a supplier example. I'm going to write the supplier of the type integer. I'm naming it as very large integer. And in the lambda, you notice that I have provided a empty parenthesis. And the reason is because get method doesn't take any input. So this lambda doesn't have any parameters. And in the body, we need to return a value of integer. So in this case, I'm just returning integer dot max value. You could return anything. You can return back one, you can return back 100 or, or whatever integer value you want to return. As long as it's an integer, it doesn't matter. Now let me go ahead and print it out. And notice that we will have to call dot get on the supplier because that's the name of the method in the functional interface. Let me create another example of a supplier. This supplier is also of type integer and I'm going to name it as random number. And again, the lambda wouldn't have any parameters. In the body, I'm going to create a new instance of random and call the next int method onto that class and give 1000 as parameter. So in this case, this lambda expression will return an integer number which will be random, but it will be less than 1000 every time we run. So let me just print this random number and see what we get when we run it. So we got 411. So it's just a random number that the method have returned. So this is a use case of a supplier. Supplier is something which will supply you a value. You, it doesn't need anything, but it will supply you a value back that you can use for your logic. Now let's check our fourth and final functional interface called comparator. When you look at the code of the comparator, you will notice that it has two unimplemented methods. So we have a compare and then we have equals. So for now, don't worry about the equals method. I'll explain you why that is not considered as unimplemented later on. But let's look into the remaining part of the functional interface and you will see all the other 
methods are either default or they have a static implementation. So the compare method takes two objects as an argument of the same type and it returns an integer value back. As long as you conform to the signature, the Lambda will compile and work fine. However, the standard is that the return value of the compare when the very first parameter O1 is considered as bigger than O2, then we should return a positive number. When O2 is bigger than O1, then we should return a negative number. And if O1 and O2 are considered as equal, then we should return back zero. So positive means O1 is bigger, negative means O2 is bigger, zero means both are equal. So that's the guidance, that's the standard way or how we override the compare method. Ignoring the equals method, which I will discuss later on, let's go back to our main method and let's try to see some examples of the comparators. I'm going to define a comparator of the type integer. I'll name it as ints, doesn't matter what name I give. And in this case, the lambda will take two parameters. If you remember from the compare method, it has two parameters in. In this case, I'll have i1 and i2. And in the body, I'm going to do i1 minus i2. Now let's see if our implementation conforms to the expected standards. Now if i1 is bigger and i2 is smaller, we will return a positive value from the lambda. And if i2 is bigger and i1 is smaller, we will return a negative value. And if they both are same, we will return zero. So this is how we would compare two integers. The comparators are a different concept in itself, but on a very high level, comparators are used to sort a list of items. In this case, this comparator can be used to sort a list of integers. And now in the exam, you might actually get a question to ask for that, if we write this kind of a comparator, then whether the list of the integers will be sorted in an ascending order or will it be sorted in a descending order? In this case, the list will be sorted in an ascending order. So just remember that you might get questions like that in the exam. Now let's see an example of a different comparator. And in this case, I'm going to create a comparator of strings. And we can use this comparator to sort the list of strings. In this case, I'm taking S1 and S2 as parameters. I have explicitly mentioned the type, but we really don't need to mention it here as I, I have already discussed in the previous part. And in the body, I'm going to use a method called compare to, which is already present on the string object. Check the documentation of the compare to and match it to the documentation of the compare. You will notice that compare to method conforms to the standards that are mentioned in the compare. So that means we can simply use S1 dot compare to S2. In this case, the comparator will sort the list of strings in the ascending order. Now let's say if I switch S2 and S1. In this case, the list of string will be sorted by descending order. And if I add a negative sign in front of this expression, which means it will return the negative of the value returned by compare to. So in this case, again, the list will be sorted in the ascending order. It's same as writing S1 dot compare to S2. If the concept of comparing is not very clear, I would strongly recommend that you go through that topic as well. But for this video, we are mainly concentrating on the Lambda part and also the functional interface on what functional interface could we use if we want to compare some two objects. Now let us discuss that. Why is equals method not considered as unimplemented? To understand the concept, let's forget about lambdas for a minute. I'm going to create a concrete class called my comparator, and I'm going to implement the comparator functional interface. Remember that functional interface is just a normal interface, so we can always implement ourselves. And also I'm going to implement the compare method over here just to get rid of the error. Now, even though I have not written here, the class definition effectively looks like public class, my comparator extends object. So this is the object that is at the very top level and implements comparator. Now, if I go into the object, 
all these methods in the object are getting inherited to the my comparator class and equals is one of them so which effectively means that the equals method is already present like the implementation of the equal method is already present and it is present via the object method so that is why the comparator functional interface has effectively only one unimplemented method which is compare and that we have to implement ourselves the implementation of equals is being inherited from the object i hope that makes it clear that is all i wanted to discuss in this particular video in the next video we are going to look into the variables and variable scope in the lambda if you have liked the video please hit the like button and do not forget to subscribe to get notified for my upcoming videos until next time bye bye